Okay, let's run. Your mission, should you choose to accept it. It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. Well, The Rock says, why don't we just cut right to the chase? Okay, now he, uh, you know, he wants to get together. Well, you know, he wants to talk. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. It's showtime, folks! What are you? I'm... Greetings and salutations. Welcome to And I Quote, the weekly show where we introduce you to content creators of all shapes and sizes that join us from many and all corners of the nerd universe. We find out more about them and we take your questions. I am your host, Ryan of Nerd Culture, and our guest this week is writer and graphic designer of eSpec Books. Please welcome Mike McVeigh. Mike, welcome. How are you? Hi, Ryan. Nice to be here. It's very, we are very happy to have you with us. Now, if you have any questions for Mike as we go throughout the course of this episode, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Our producer is going to be keeping an eye on that as we go throughout the course of the show. And don't forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends. And, and in the meantime, so, Mike, what would you say were some of your favorite books or writers growing up? Oh, that's really simple. The very first uh, sci-fi I ever read was Arthur C. Clarke's... Ah, sorry, gum. Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama. That pretty much set the pattern for the rest of my life as far as both science fiction and my life in general. Oh, okay. All right. There you go. Right right up, right up, there into the point. Good, good stuff. Now, what would you say were some of your favorite movies or TV series, past or present? Well, Star Trek, once again, also influenced a lot of what I was growing up. I mean the joy of the original Star Trek and subsequently some of the other series um, inspired me to not only study aeronautical engineering, but to apply to NASA to be a mission specialist. Oh. Now I'm the youngest of three brothers in a military family. So joining the Air Force was eventually also on that list. Wouldn't say Star Trek uh, motivated that, but it was definitely uh, inspired by the need to serve others. Star Wars, of course, was a great moment in my life in 77. Not many of you were around in 77, I assume. <laughs> but yes, it struck me uh, back when there was just one movie called Star Wars. It was a great time. I had friends. We used to go to conventions. We used to costume. So that will always stay as the high point of my life for now. For now. Mm -hmm. Ah, Well, clearly the force is strong with this one. When did you decide to become a writer? Uh, I didn't. Back in the 80s, I did uh, game development for the Alliance Archives Martial Role-Playing Game. Oh. My wife was always a writer. In fact, if you've seen any of her work from when she was in, even in elementary school, she used to make books. Well, she wanted to become a uh, full-on writer as an adult and eventually uh, started uh, publishing. So she asked me if she could write <clears throat> in the Alliance Archives universe, the gaming universe. Oh. So I laid down some, uh, well, what we now call the technical Bible, things that you see in the universe, how they're described, how they're used. So I wrote a short story, which was tech heavy, almost like a uh, David Weber novel in some cases. She looked at me and said, you ever thought about writing? I said, no. It's like, you should. And that's where it all started. I was dragged kicking and screaming into this. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Wow. Goodness gracious. Never know what's going to happen. What would you say are some of the biggest rewards about being a writer? Biggest rewards? Well, only about 1% ever obtain fame and fortune. In my case, we used to go to the conventions. She would be allowed to go through the door that said guests, but I couldn't follow half the time. Oh. So when I became a writer, I started becoming a guest. So I can now travel and be with my wife at conventions rather than just watching her from the audience. Well, that's my, that's my biggest takeaway for being an author. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the opposite side of the fence, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges about being a writer? Besides being good and knowing your craft, finding inspiration for creating it. Hmm. Getting some lag off of you. Are you all right? Uh, yeah. yeah, I seem to be fine. Okay, because from this this side, I'm getting transmission lags. But I think oh. my computer wants to update itself, which is always a bad thing. Oh. Sorry about that. 
well, that's that's Microsoft doing what it wants with my system. Ah, I see. But uh, you were you were saying, uh, what are some of the uh, biggest challenges about being a writer? Uh, finding inspiration for your projects, and then doing it well enough for someone to say, "Hey, I'd like to buy that." I mean, you could write the next great graphic novel. Sorry, not graphic novel. The next great novel, but if no one wants it, what's its purpose? You enjoyed writing it, but it's not advancing the cause in a sense. I mean, you need to make money as a writer to continue being a writer. Otherwise, you have to go back to your day job. Ah, I see your point. I see your point. And once again, we are talking with uh, Mike McVale of Eastspec Books here on this episode of And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this with all of your closest friends. If you have any questions for Mike, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Whether you are watching this live or on the replay, thank you so much for being with us. We do appreciate it. What would you say are some of the rewards about being a graphic designer? Well, right now it's very tricky, especially with the uh, birth of AI art. Mm. Um, for me, the best reward is when the um, author of a project I'm working on sends me information about what a character looks like. Mm -hmm. I then spend time designing the character, and for the very first time, the author actually gets to see their creation on the cover of their book. Mm. This is one of my favorite things currently. Ah. In fact, nice. I invested uh, big bucks in a uh, new graphics computer, oh. which has changed a lot. I use tower-based computers. I don't use laptops because they're easier to um, swap out parts over time. This new one is so different. It's a giant glass and uh, steel box with a large gray cube in the middle of it, which I'm told is the GPU, ah. which only became available after crypto mining uh, declined. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we invested a lot of money in uh, that new technology so we can make photo realistic cover designs now. Hmm. There you well, go. In science fiction and uh, a lot of fantasy, actually having the character on the cover helps. Yes. So we're yes. putting a lot more effort into that these days. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I, I would agree with that. What would you say are some challenges about being a graphic designer? Overall, uh, being able to do it. I mean, it is a lot more than just sitting down at your computer and writing in prompts. Mm -hmm. uh, but that didn't come into existence until, what, less than a year ago? The AI mm -hmm. revolution is just that new. The U.S. Copyright Office has pretty much banned the idea that someone typing keywords is actually creating art. So thus, you cannot copyright that. Uh... It still has to have a human influence. You can use elements of AI in the background or even as an enhancement. But at the end of the day, a human still has to uh, produce it in order for it to be copywritten. <clears throat> so you really don't own anything you make on the AI, in fact. Oh, okay. okay. I've been following the uh, stable diffusion since before it was just a concept. Mm -hmm. I've been excited by the idea that I could just sweep my brush across the uh, electronic canvas and create landscapes or enhancements. Mm -hmm. But it's become a lot more than that these days. I mean, if you read the terms of service for most AI, you're free to sell it and claim it, but the company who's pro, um, who you process through owns it. So hmm. in theory, they want you to take the blame for any copyright infringement, for example, because there are no laws that have been set up yet to basically deal with these problems. But the AI art isn't art yet. There's still a whole legal battle that has yet to be fought. In fact, the uh, writer strike is about using AI to rewrite existing scripts, write new scripts based on old scripts. That's one of the key points in their uh, strike right now. I mean, and it came at a great time because there are no laws, as I said, governing the AI yet. So if they set down the precedents, it might save them somewhere downrange. Wow. Okay. All right. Some tricky stuff there. Got to be careful. Otherwise, Skynet may take over. <laughs> You know, so I know that's a warped version of saying that, but hey, you know, is what it is. With that, with that being said, I do want to share something with you here. And for those of you who are listening on the uh, audio feed, we're looking at a cover here for something known as If We Had Known. So how did this come about? This is what I call a negative space image. I had seen a uh, movie poster that used something very similar in design where the image was behind the text. And the idea had excited me and I'd wanted a project in order to do it. And though none came my way, so it's like, well, I'll just start a new franchise. 
my original franchise was defending the future, which is military science fiction. Mm -hmm. I'd wanted to do just hardcore science fiction. So it's like I started this series, Beyond the Cradle, specifically to create this style cover. Wow. Well, well it is certainly captivating. It looks fantastic, by the way. Yes, it's uh, basically just stock art mm -hmm. on the backside of uh, the text cutout. That's all it is. We're now moving to the point where we're also creating our own stock art. So we don't have to actually, uh, you see, we don't own the art that's behind there. Mm -hmm. If you own the art, you can do so much more with it. When you get something from Shutterstock, you're basically just renting it for first use. Oh. So I couldn't make t-shirts, mugs, or whatever from the Shutterstock art. But if we make our own background art, which we're trying to learn how to do in Blender, which has a lot more uh, capability to do such things, then we are free to advertise, sell it, and do much more than just put it on the cover of a book. There you go. Really well done. Really excellent cover. Another uh, something else I'd like to share with you is In Harm's Way. How did this all come about? Well, that is the Defending the Future series. That's book six or seven in the series. Now, they're all standalone anthologies, so you don't have to buy all the others in order to uh, uh, read this one. Basically, we had a friend, an author named C.J. Henderson, who was always looking for projects. I was homesick from a convention one day, and I got a call from my wife. Someone had pitched an idea of doing a military science fiction anthology, and they wanted me to be the editor. Now, keep on, I've done no books at this point. I used to do game design back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So they say, we want you to be the editor. We also want you to do the cover art. It's like, okay, who have you been talking to? Apparently, CJ had had the bright idea we'd create a brand new series for him to put work into. And thus, Defending the Future was born. Um, it's basically military science fiction. We try to keep it into a basic theme. This way, a reader isn't just lost all over the storylines. The book was originally the series was originally part of a small press that no longer exists. When my wife developed her own small press, which is eSpec Books, mm -hmm. we took the series on board and continued it. Continued it. So when I had much more control over the books, we got a cover that looks like that. Um, In Harm's Way are all about rescue and recovery stories, mm -hmm. and the art of the cover is supposed to reflect that. Absolutely, absolutely. Leave no one behind. That's basically us. Yes. Ah, understandable, understandable. And once again, we are talking with uh, writer and graphic designer Mike McVail of eSpec Books here in this episode of And I Quote. If this is your first time here, welcome. Don't forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends. If you have any questions for Mike, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Be more than happy to take those from you and thank you for being with us once again with with that being said have there been any special memories for you from being at conventions or other events whether you are there as a vendor or there as an attendee special memories beyond yes. seeing the stars in many occasions meeting some of my favorite science fiction authors it's uh, before marrying my wife i used to go to conventions then after marrying my wife i went to conventions as a guest and a dealer and all that fun stuff so i have really two different timelines sure in the old days it was being among friends being in among the uh, cast members of star trek i've seen all the original cast members back when they were doing star trek the motion picture their technical advisor from nasa was a guy named jesco von putkemmer he's the guy who kind of pushed star trek into being more realistic science fiction for the motion picture. Mm -hmm. I've seen Isaac Asimov, a wide spectrum in the early days. Now I get to sit in the green room as an author and talk to all these authors. Uh, wow. It's a very long and winding list. Many of them now know me by sight. So if I walked into a room, I'm not a stranger to the people I used to read growing up. And that's always struck me as a uh, turning point in my life to be not only just a fan, but to be kind of at the outer edge of their club in a sense. Oh, I see. I see. Well, that's really cool. That's, that's really cool. That's great. And I'm glad you're able to uh, work, you know, see all these kind folks and see them at different events and different conventions, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. What advice would you give to aspiring writers out there? Oh read read and learn your craft 
Um, AI supported writing is okay, but now they're running into problems where people are just typing in keywords and letting the computer write the entire story. Oh. A story has to have some meaning to you. Otherwise, why would I be interested in reading it? Yeah, so although it is much easier to publish these days or self-publish, you still need to know what you're doing in order to make that work. If you're writing for your own fun, that's one thing. If you have visions of turning in the next great novel and becoming uh, oh, the next multi-millionaire with movie rights, yeah, that's less than 1% of any author who ever existed. Did that answer the question or did I ramble again? No, <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Yes, it did answer the question about honing your craft, reading as much as you can and, and learning. So yes, you did. You did answer the question. Uh, when it comes to advice for those who are aspiring to become graphic designers, what advice would you give them? Oh, oh. Don't copy other people's work. It is okay to look at someone's design and say, yeah, I like that idea. Like the cover of If We Had Known was inspired by something else, but it is not anything like the original piece that inspired me. It was just simply the idea of an image through the text. It doesn't look anything like the original movie poster that I was inspired by. YouTube and the internet has such incredible resources for learning how to use your software, color theory, and just the basic idea of what makes up a good cover. Now, I do freelance work as well, and some of the projects that I've done for eSpec are equally as bizarre. I will get a piece of art that the author says, I love this, turn this into the cover. I will look at it and go, no, I can't. Either the image is in the wrong place for text placement, the colors are all off, but usually the biggest problem is it's the wrong size and resolution to be used by the printer. Now, we use a service called Lightning Source, which is one of the uh, biggest publishers. They're also tied into a whole series of... Um, Oh, my wife would be able to explain this. She, ta she handles the inside, I handle the outside. But you have to be able to take your image and then eventually put it into a format where you can put it on what we call the template. The template then goes to the printer, who then in turn produces the book. If you can't get it from the finished, you know, from a piece of art mm -hmm. to the template, it's not going to become a book. Ah, I see. I see. Gotcha. One, now, I worked one. in the uh, printing industry for four years mm -hmm. as a proofing supervisor. So getting an image onto the template is no problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. I see. Yeah, so, I, sorry. No, no, no. I, I'm sorry. Did you have something else you want to add? So basically, e-spec books, mm -hmm. if you look at the... Um, our capability, something that most uh, individuals or even small press don't have. My wife, Danielle, worked in the industry for um, oh, Random House for uh, oh, five, six years. Plus, she worked in other printing houses. So she has that side of the industry down. I have the printing and graphic design side down. So between the two of us, we have the uh, skills and resources to pr produce a finished book. This is the tricky bit for most people uh, trying to start out. Uh, yeah. I see, I see. Cohesive unit, teamwork. One covers one side of the fence, the other one covers the other side, and it works together as, as, as a team right there. Which is exactly why I can't answer some questions because I've gotten so used to my wife handling the other side of the equation that I don't bother dedicating brain cells to it. <laughs> That's all good. That's all good. If you could have a conversation with any author, living or dead, who would it be and why? Hmm. Terry Pratchett. He was one of my uh, favorite fantasy authors. He had a fantasy universe which worked in the same way a real universe did. People, even though it was a fantastic setting, it was a day-to-day -day environment. They were just people in funny clothes in some cases. It's like his entire sense of humor worked for me. I would love to just sit there and ask him, how did he come up with his ideas? Did you literally just walk down the street, see the world and go, well, if we turn this into that, this into that, and then take it to an odd extreme? I'd just love to know how he did that. All right. All right. 
Good stuff, good stuff. And once again, we are talking with Mike McVail of East Spec Books on this episode of And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this with all of your closest friends. If you have any questions for Mike, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Be more than happy to hear from you. And 100 percent true. That's it, that, man. That's 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 good. That's good stuff. If one of your books was to be turned into a potential series, which one would you choose? Well, that would be Defending the Future. But that's an anthology series. In fact, Netflix has one called Love, Death, and Robots, which is an anthology series. Hmm. And it's a mixed anthology. Although it's mostly horror and science fiction, it... Oh, there's my cat. <laughs> uh, it covers a wide range. Uh, mostly it's CG special effects or CG uh, shorts. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that sort of thing for Defending the Future. Because we have some A-list authors in the series... And I'm sure they'd be very, very happy to have their works turned into something like that. Hmm. There you go. So definitely, definitely sounds like a plan. How would you say one overcomes something known as imposter syndrome? I would need more context to the definition of imposter syndrome because it comes in a wide variety of. Okay. All right. So I, uh, you're right. All right. Sorry. Let me let me uh, let me give you some um, background. So imposter syndrome is where. Someone who is writing something, putting together a story, or they, they're they trying to get their book published and something to that effect, where they're writing it, but they keep comparing themselves to other people's writing or other people's success in their field. So basically, a new writer who wants to write a really good story is comparing, is trying to achieve the same success or comparing themselves to other writers where they shouldn't be doing that. They should be focusing on becoming their own self and their own writer. That's what imposter syndrome is. They don't want to become the same type of writer uh, that they may look up to. They want to become their own writer. So how, in your mind, would someone overcome imposter syndrome, by, which means you're comparing yourself to others, but you shouldn't be? How would you overcome that? Oh, well, that's uh, interesting. I've never actually experienced that, per se. Mm -hmm. Overcoming imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Well, generally, if you present your work to someone and it, that's, it's rejected would be your first warning. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, someone's going to look at this and go, oh, you just basically uh, scraped the serial numbers off another story. Or this was just an adaptation of someone else's work. That's pretty easy to spot. Mm -hmm. As far as overcoming it, that really is up to the individual. Either he's going to learn that he keeps failing and he's going to have to try something else. Or maybe someone will come along and explain to him how to get past this. It's like, yes, you understand how this works, but this isn't your idea. You need to find something that is yours and more work forward from it rather than just rehashing someone else's ideas because obviously if you're being an imposter you're going to have to copy whoever you want to basically model and that's going to become very obvious very quickly as far as overcoming it some people never do some people crash and burn and that's pretty much the end of it ah there you go there you go so yeah that's that's what i was uh getting at when it comes to the certain definitions of imposter syndrome, but we appreciate you sharing your thoughts about it and how there are certain ways to overcome. And I do want to let you know that this episode of Anti Quote and every episode of Anti Quote is indeed powered by good friends over there at Poddex. Now, Poddex are the hottest new tool for podcasters looking to have more meaningful conversations or gamify their podcasts. You simply shuffle up the cards, you <laughs> ask a question, and you let the content roll. Get yours today at poddex.com and use that code RYAN10. That's R-Y-A-N-1-0, ryan 10 for 10 percent off your order mike when you think Ooh. about success who comes to your mind and why success mm -hmm. could be anybody uh, in any field well since my background is aeronautical engineering there are a lot of unsung heroes that have developed things that you wouldn't know their names but you use their devices every day I'm not going to give you an example because that list goes on forever. Right. Success is where you sit back and go, yes, I did something that made a difference. I mean, oh, yes, I'd like to be wealthy and well known for it. But it really deep down, it's like, yes, I did my job and it worked. That's what I do define as success. There you go. What are you currently curious about? Curious about? Could be anything. Oh, 
well, besides the ongoing AI controversy, mm -hmm. there's all new aspects of technology that I constantly uh, run across on YouTube and then uh, cross-reference that in real life to see where it's going. The new design in uh, batteries that get away from lithium is one thing I've been following. But as I said, that's, that's technology. I've got all sorts of little fiddly bits that uh, amuse me that I'll eventually go on to explore. Now, I haven't been writing for the last decade because uh, I've been needed more as a graphic artist. Mm -hmm. But if I was writing, I would basically be finding ways to integrate this, not force it into a story. But if I have an opportunity to use it, I would then use it in a story. I mean, one of the fun things back when we were working on the Alliance Archives role-playing game is we were ahead of the curve in some of the technology. The joy of being at uh, an aeronautical academy is the government's constantly stopping by to see who they want to take away. I mean, yes, we have some interesting ideas. Before DARPA became DARPA, which is the military science. Oh. Oh, I can't actually define what DARPA is per se because it keeps changing. But it's the think tank where they get all the scientists together to make new toys for the military and sometimes for NASA. Mm -hmm. So they were constantly around the academy looking for uh, new recruits. So we're always being shown little experiments and how to do things like the hypersonic aircraft was very experimental in the days. This is an aircraft that uses a ramjet in order to propel itself. Supposedly the Russians have them right now and are shooting them as missiles. But there are all sorts of material science techniques that they were looking to explore. And they were laying it out in front of us in the hopes that one of us might have a brilliant moment and give them the answer they were looking for. So I'm constantly looking for little bits of technology. That's what fascinates me. There you go. There you go. Future of technology. It's an amazing thing. You never know what's going to happen. With that being said, what's one bad habit that you're trying to get rid of? Uh, not wanting to sit at my computer and go play in the sun. Hmm. For the last three years, it's just been locked up in the attic doing my work. I mean, we are in the office right now. My workstation is mm -hmm. back that way. Over yonder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with I'm sitting on my wife's work, workstation, which is more of a, a uh, text-based, mm -hmm. where mine is graphic design. Mm -hmm. So getting outside is the really big thing for me right now. I went outside, worked in the yard, hurt my back, so now I'm stuck inside for three weeks. Mm. So, yeah, my desire to get out and play in the sun is not working yet. Hmm. All right. Well, we do wish you the best with, you know, the recovery and you're able to go out and experience uh, some nice sunny weather. Mm -hmm. So 100% uh, for that, we wish you the best. And if you had to teach a class on one thing, what would you teach? Text layout. Putting text on a cover is um, tricky. I mean, not only is the image important, but the text, positioning, the style, the coloring tells you or gives you the feel for what the book is about. If I can't look at a cover and figure out what it's about from just that, then they haven't done the job properly. There you go. Every piece of the book is just as important as anything else. So there you go. What's the worst job you've ever had? Worst job <clears throat> I've ever had. Yeah, I'm trying to review back over six decades. Um, worst job I've ever had. I was a security guard at Kennedy Airport. I was oh. what they call a ramp agent. This is where I was out underneath the aircraft ah. in all weather. We mm. had a um, cold front come through and the temperatures were in the minuses. And I'm not actually dressed to be out under an aircraft. And my boss would not send in anyone to replace me. I actually walked off from the job that day. And that was the worst moment in my life as far as work goes. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Yeah, but that's not bad. We also had bomb scares, so but this was back in the uh, 80s. Oh, okay. Coming back some sometime. Goodness gracious. Man, you were in, I guess in some s some way, shape, or form, you were in worse conditions than John McClane was in Die Hard 2 at the airport. Well, I had my shoes on, at least. Oh, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that is... the, the, the movie was grossly inaccurate, just reference. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. someone who's worked on the ramp and been in the airport, it doesn't work that way. Mm -mm. Too many creative liberties were taken, and it's just called Hollywood movie magic, but it doesn't make it real. Correct, but I enjoyed it nevertheless. Oh, okay. 
I mean, I mean, this is probably a silly follow-up question to that. Is is that one of your? Is that like your least favorite installment of the franchise? Because I'm assuming the original is your favorite. You mean the Christmas movie? Yes. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say sure. it's. I actually haven't finished the last one. I have it on uh, Blu-ray, but I haven't gotten around to watching it. You know. Oh, I mean, you mean the, the the most recent one, A Good Day to Die Hard? Right. I have not seen that yet. I have the disc, but I do not. I haven't watched it yet. You know, that all piles up after a while. Hmm. <sighs> Yeah, man, yeah, my two, my, this, I, I don't know what they call it these days, whether it's to be binged or to be watched, because we know what TBR stands for. That stands for to be read, which is a to be read pile. Right. TBW, I guess, to Ooh. be watched. I, I don't know. Is there a more correct acronym for that? I'm not sure. But I have the, what do you call it? The, I have the Die Hard collection that has all five films. Mm-hmm. I don't see myself going back to Die Hard 5. I can watch Die Hard 1. Maybe two two is okay, but then Die Hard with a Vengeance is fantastic because it's Jeremy freaking Irons <laughs> and Sam Jackson. You can't go wrong yeah. with those, either of those two actors. And then Live Free or Die Hard was actually quite good. Some people throw it under a bus. I know why, mm. but I enjoyed it for what it was. And then A Good Day to Die Hard came out, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I would mm. rather watch Live Free or Die Hard compared to this. But that's just my two cents. Right. I can't speak for everybody, but that you know, that's just my two cents on the matter. But in that case... Yippee ki everyone, and thank you for joining us for this episode of And I Quote with uh, writer and graphic designer Mike McVale of eSpec Books. Mike, thank you so much for being here. Where can the person watching or listening to this follow you on social media and everything that you have coming up? Well, you can follow me at anything that's associated with eSpec Books. Mm-hmm. I don't have much of a uh, net presence right now because we're switching um, uh, net providers. Mm-hmm. So this is a teething process right now. So, as I said, anything at eSpecBooks.com you can find me at. Yeah, there you go. Well, thank you very much for joining us here, Mike. We do greatly appreciate it. My name is Ryan of NerdCulture. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RyanRPM5. All the links to where you can follow myself as well as Mike McVeigh are located within the description of this episode. So make sure you check that out. And we got a lot of great things coming your way very soon. Lots of great shows. So many guests coming in for And I Quote. And we just made our big announcement as far as a future guest that's going to be on the show with us on Thursday night, May the 11th. It is actor and writer David Fielding, who played the original Zordon on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers back in the 90s. He is going to be here with us on Thursday night, May the 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. We are so, so, so more phenomenally excited to have him here with us. That is going to be a lot of fun. Also, we have a new episode of Nerdy Projects. It's going to go live on Wednesday, May the 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure you're following us on social media. We're going to have some indie creators of all kinds, and they are going to be here with us telling them a little, telling us a little bit about themselves, what projects they have either currently or planned for the future. It's going to be a very, very exciting show. We're very happy to have it back here this month in the month of May. So that's going to be on Wednesday, May the 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern time, just to be uh, a little bit more specific. And also, we are this close to hitting 1,000 subscribers. And once we do, we are going to throw an incredible live stream celebration with returning guests, some surprises, and some special giveaways for you, our incredible fans, which we are very thankful that you are here. We're very thankful that you're enjoying our content. We hope you enjoy everything that we have coming up. And once again, don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, smash that notification bell so you get notified of when our new videos go up. And in the meantime, stay healthy, stay strong, stay safe. Happy free comic book day on May the 6th here, 2023. And remember, life is better when reading. Take a look. Famous Faces and Funnies in Melbourne, Florida is leading the way in pop culture fun. From comic books and graphic novels to Funko Pops and collector's items, Famous Faces and Funnies has it all. Rick Shea and the professional team at Famous Faces and Funnies are friendly and knowledgeable. Whether you're looking for toys, props, collector treasures, or a new comic book, Famous Faces and Funnies is your one-stop shop. To find Famous Faces and Funnies on Facebook and Twitter, just type at FFFComics.
Author Cindy Kep is writing on the edge. Books include Remnant in the Stars, The Loudest Actions, Lines of Succession, Mindstorm, Condemned Courier, The Yerushalon Series, and Animal Eye. Find author Cindy Kep at C-K-O-E-P-P dot com today. You've worked hard and written a great book. Now it's time to give it a great cover. If you're an indie author or small press publisher, Plasma Fire Graphics is your source for affordable cover illustration and graphic design. Plasma Fire Graphics, when the look of your book matters to you. Good morning! Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs>